So today's webinar, as I've said, anticipating new weights in the CLSA, unpacking sampling weights and their use. And I'm really delighted to introduce our speaker, Dr. Lauren Griffith. Uh, Lauren is an Associate Scientific Director and the Hamilton Site Lead of the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. She's an Associate Professor in the Department of Health Research Methods, Evidence and Impact at McMaster University. And her research interests include physical functioning, multimorbidity and frailty, as well as the harmonization of longitudinal data. And I think that for many of the, us, this is a long-awaited uh, webinar uh, to discuss the weights and the new weights that we're going to be using in the CLSA. So I invite Lauren now to begin uh, the webinar. Thanks, Lauren. Thank you very much, Tina. Um, I'm very happy to be here today to um, to uh, give this presentation. Um, let me just see if I can get started here. So as um, Tina suggested, I'm going to be talking about the new weights in the CLSA, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the development of weights and how we use them in the CLSA as well. And I would be remiss if I didn't start this presentation um, without acknowledging the incredible contributions made by uh, Dr. Mary Thompson and Dr. Ching Bao Wu from the University of Waterloo and Dr. Harry Shannon, who is now emeritus at McMaster in the original uh, creation of the CLSA weights, as well as Dr. Nazmol Sohel, Dr. Arun Erbaz Oz, and Dr. Henry So in their work in also creating the weights, um, creating the documentation for the weights. And as you will see, there's some new documentation that um, Dr. So has created that I think will be of interest to many people in terms of how the weights should be used in analyses. So I wanted to start by giving a brief outline of what will be covered in the talk. So I'm going to give a fairly high level um, description of why do we use sampling weights at all. Talk a little bit about um, the CLSA sampling and the use of sampling weights in the CLSA and what we provide and then about why we need new sampling weights, and finally, how the original sampling weights and the new sampling weights differ and when they will be available, and then a little bit about what's coming next. So I wanted to be uh, upfront so as not to disappoint anyone during the presentation. Um, what I won't be doing is giving technical guidance on the use of sampling weights during this presentation. But as I said, at the end of the at the end of the presentation, there'll be some additional information that maybe a little bit of a, a bit of a cliffhanger right now in terms of what will be available on the CLSA website that will be useful in this um, in, in this aspect. So, without any further ado, I'll start the talk with why do we use sampling weights? And essentially what we do when we do any sort of research projects is we collect data from a sample of people, usually participants in our, in our, um, in our situation. But what we want to really do with this sample is we want to make generalizations about the population that the sample represents. But the issue is that the sample is almost never fully representative of the population. And so what we do is we create sampling weights. So let's assume in a very simple case that we have our population. And in this population, there's 50% females and 50% males. But when we draw our sample, for whatever reason, our sample has 70% females and 30% males. But we still want to make some inferences or draw conclusions about the population. So what we do is we create sampling weights. And so, as I said, essentially the sampling weights are used to make the statistics that we compute from our 
data from our sample data more representative of the population. Um, it's a standard practice in surveys to use sampling weights. And then each participant in the study, in the sample, is assigned a weight that is constructed based on the, their inclusion probability. And I'll give a little bit of an example of that, what, this, what we mean by inclusion probability in the next slides. But essentially, sampling weights are always positive and non-zero. So in our example, when we have our population of 50-50 in terms of sex, and in our sample of 70-30, we know that we have an underrepresentation in this sample of males and an overrepresentation of females. So if you could see the red text, you could see the formula that we could use to create our basic inflation weights. So here, this formula you can see has something to do with the population of, say, females in the target population, or sorry, the number, or the proportion of females in the target population and the proportion in our sample, as well as the total number in our target population and the number in our sample. So how does this actually work? So let's say we have our target population is 200 people, 100 females, 100 males, and we draw our sample of 30. And as I said before, it was 70% females and 30% males. So in our sample, we have 21 females and nine males. So what we can do then is we can figure out how many people in our target population each person in our sample represents. So in this case, each female in our sample represents 100 divided by 21 or 4.76 um, people. And for males, each male is going to represent 11.11 .11 people. And again, intuitively, it makes sense because we have, um, we have males underrepresented in our sample that they're going to have a larger weight when we want to try and um, generalize back to the population. So this is a very kind of high level um, example, but essentially it really is what we do in, in CLSA in creating the weights. It's a little bit more complicated because our sampling is more complicated, but that is essentially what the weights are doing. So I wanted to start and just make sure um, that everyone who's attending the webinar, I know many people have used CLSA data and I'll probably be um, telling you something that you already are very well aware of, but just to make sure that everyone is aware of the design of the CLSA, I just want to take a minute to review this slide. So in the CLSA, um, the target was to uh, recruit 50,000 participants age 45 to 85 at baseline. And we started recruitment, as you can see on the bottom of the figure, in 2010. We finished recruitment in 2015. And of that 50,000, our, our um, target was to um, recruit 20,000. We actually created or recruited 21,241 uh, participants who would be randomly selected within the 10 provinces. And these people, that these participants provided their questionnaire data by computer-assisted telephone interviewing. And we generally refer to these people as tracking participants. And I'll probably use that as I'm going through the slides. The other 30,000 of the 50,000, and again, actual, the actual number was 30,097, were to be randomly selected from a catchment area 10 to 50 kilometers around um, 11 data collection sites uh, located throughout Canada. 
And the reason that these people were in a geographically restricted area is that we were going to collect the data through in-person, in-home interviews. But these people also came to one of the data collection sites across Canada and provided additional clinical and physical tests as well as um, blood and urine if they consented to do so. So as you can see, as we move down in this figure, that at baseline, we completed baseline recruitment by 2015. And then every three years, we have another wave of data collection. So we completed follow-up one in 2018, and we are in the middle of uh, our follow-up two, even with um, our COVID restrictions, we're still collecting data via telephone interviews from all of our participants, and we'll be finishing follow-up to in the spring or summer of 2021. So just to give you an idea again what this looks like, and I should have said the, the, the latter group that we collect the data in person and at the data collection site, we usually refer to them as the comprehensive cohort. So this slide gives you an idea of what we think of in terms of our sampling for the tracking people. They're represented by the purple um, dots in the map. So they're essentially a stratified random sample of the, of the um, 10 provinces. And then the green dots represent the data collection sites. And you can see that they're, although they're not clearly a random sample, they are distributed across Canada, but they're not in every province. So we do, we have um, three in British Columbia and Victoria has a data collection site and then Vancouver and Surrey actually share one data collection site. In Calgary, Alberta, Winnipeg, Manitoba, um, we have them in Hamilton and Ottawa, in Ontario, and in Montreal and Sherbrooke, in Quebec, as well as Halifax and in St. John. So if you think about in terms of our sampling, the sample was chosen randomly through the, um, through the 10 provinces, but the date at the data collection sites, there was a, a geographically limited sample for the comprehensive. So um, one thing that can be quite challenging when you're trying to recruit 50,000 people is to be able to do it with one sampling frame. That would have been nice, but we had to use multiple sampling frames to actually multiple methods to, to recruit our sample. So a sampling frame is just a list of all the possible sampling units or in our case, participants, people. And so our first sampling frame that we used, and this was in the tracking only, was the Canadian Community Health Survey on Healthy Aging. And this was actually, um, a survey that was done by Statistics Canada. And it, for the first time, Statistics Canada allowed um, the participants of CCHS Healthy Aging to be asked if they would be consent to provide their contact information to CLSA researchers for the purpose of recruitment into the CLSA. And so this was our first sampling frame, and essentially our inclusion and exclusion criteria were adapted from this as our first sampling frame. But we also recruited people using provincial health registries, as well as telephone sampling. And for comprehensive only, we did recruit some participants through the NUAGE study, which is the Quebec Longitudinal Study on Nutrition and Aging. So you could see in terms of our example of picking that nice little sample, it gets more complex as you have multiple um, sampling frames. The other thing that we did in CLSA is we used stratified random sampling. And stratified random sampling 
it's just a matter of a population. So the full population is subdivided into mutually excluded subpopulations. And simple random sampling is used to draw the sample from each of these subpopulations. And why do you do randomized uh, or sorry, stratified random sampling, um, it can be done for a number of reasons. It can be done for convenience, but it can also be done to provide more precise estimates under many circumstances. And when I mean precise estimates, I mean that with less variance or a confidence interval would be tighter. And also to obtain estimates for the subpopulations. And here in the CLSA, it was really mostly done for these last two reasons. And we knew that the CLSA, clearly it's a, it's a study of Canada, but it would be really important for us to be able to at least look at province level estimates because we want to look for differences or similarities across provinces. And you can imagine if we just did um, simple random sampling, we'd have very few participants from provinces that were smaller, like PEI, and we'd have a lot of participants in larger provinces like Ontario and Quebec and BC. So we used a number of strata in CLSA, and we had the 10 provinces for tracking, seven from comprehensive, as you remember, they're not in the data collection sites are not in every province. Um, we use male and female as a strata. We balanced the sample between those two as best we could. We also used age group as strata, and we had four essentially 10-year age groups. And what we did here was our goal was to have about 60% of the sample in the two younger age categories in two younger age groups and about 40% of the sample in the older two age groups because as it is a um, CLSA is a study of aging, we wanted to make sure that we had enough population in the younger age groups so we could look at transitions and trajectories over time. <clears throat> We also had um, a strata of the data collection site catchment area or non-catchment area. And this was um, to create the overall CLSA weights because you can imagine that for each data collection site, we had about 30 or 3,000 participants. So we oversampled in those areas if we wanted to actually combine the tracking and the comprehensive um, groups together to have an overall CLSA sample. So we had to take that into account as well. Um, and so that was our early plan. And what we found was um, early on we did analyses and we realized like many cohort studies or studies in general, there was an underrepresentation of people uh, with lower SES with respect to education and income. And we, um, we wanted to try and figure out how best to rectify this. We knew that we potentially could not be um, completely representative with respect to this. But the other part was that, was, which was just as important, was that um, we needed to have enough people, enough heterogeneity across SES so that we could have um, well-powered statistical tests to look at this as a factor because we knew that SES clearly is a factor in health and aging. So what we chose to do, and we had to take into account in, in, terms, of our, um, in terms of our sample weights, is we chose to oversample from dissemination areas. So these are just geographical areas um, that we identified using census data that had a higher percent of people with lower levels of education. So in the end, we ended up with um, the geographical education strata as well. So lower levels of education versus higher levels of education. 
So we had to use all of this information then to create our weights. So we have two types of weights. Um, the first weight is what we call an inflation weight. And this is in, um, we've constructed this for the tracking um, sample, for the comprehensive sample, and for CLSA overall. But essentially what this is, we start by creating the basic design weight, which is the proportional, which are proportional to the reciprocal of the inclusion probabilities that we, we computed those. So that's kind of similar to what we did in that first example when each male, uh, each male represented 11.1 .11 people in the population. So we created these design weights and then we recalibrated them to sum to the overall targeted eligible Canadian population. So again, sim similar to that other sample, if we would have added up the weights for all of the females in our sample of 30 and all of the males in our sample, we would have gotten back to the actual target, the t actual number of people in the target population in that simple product in that simple example. But here again, we wanted to then um, recalibrate them to the CLSA or to the R target sample. And as you remember, because the CCHS was our first um, sampling frame um, and we used very similar inclusion exclusion criteria as the CCHS healthy aging, we thought that would be a good way to actually, uh, a good source to use to recalibrate our weights. So um, we have inflation weights again, and inflation weights are used for the estimation of descriptive parameters. So they reflect the estimated parameters in the target population. So a descriptive po uh, parameter would be, say, the mean grip strength. So we want to say something about the mean grip strength in Canadians between 45 to 85 that meet all of our inclusion and exclusion criteria. Or you could estimate something like the prevalence of, of uh, coronary heart disease. So you can't have a, a, a webinar on sampling without at least one formula. But again, just to give you more of an intuitive feel of how the weights are used. And again, a very simple example of, say, the, uh, estimating the prevalence of coronary heart disease. So here in the numerator, we're just we're just summing over, adding all of the values of the weight times this yi. So each person has their own weight, and yi is one if the participant had coronary heart disease and zero otherwise. So here, oops, sorry, here, if we sum all of these together, this numerator is going to represent the number of people in the target population with coronary heart disease. And then the denominator is just the sum of the weights, and that's going to be the number of people in the target population. So that's going to give us the prevalence of CHD in the target population. And you can see as well is if all the weights were one, so that each individual just had a weight of one, that numerator, it would be the number of people in the CLSA with CHD, and the denominator would be the number of people in the CLSA. So that would just be the prevalence of CHD in our sample. So with the weights, we're able to um, take our sample estimate estimates and uh, provide estimates that are generalizable to our target population. So there's also another type of weights that is called uh, analytic weights. And these are proportional to the inflation weights, but they're rescaled to sum to the size, um, the sample size within each province. So their mean value is one within each province. 
And these weights are intended to be used for modeling. So, for example, in regression analyses where um, the weighting variables are included in these models. And so why do we need the two kinds of weights? You can imagine that the weights, even if we take a relatively um, large sample, the weights in, in um, a place, a province like PEI, is going to, the weights will be relatively small because they just have to weight up to the population in PEI. Whereas if we take maybe even a little bit of a bigger sample in Ontario, the weights for that sample have to weight up to the population of Ontario. So provinces with larger populations are, tend to have much higher inflation weights compared to smaller provinces. And so the observations from those strata would tend to dominate statistical analyses. But with the analytic weights, the point estimates will be fairly similar, should be the same, but they are more efficient if the model is correctly specified. So what we mean by efficient, again, that's a statistical term. That means if you have a number of um, unbiased estimates of a parameter, the one that has the smallest variance is going to be the most efficient. So again, we're trying to get the most precise estimates of our, of our um, parameters that we're estimating. So um, we have our weights for the pooled data for all of the CLSA then, and the inflation weights were provided for the two subcohorts, but also for the full CLSA. And that was based on the tracking and comprehensive inclusion probabilities for participants within the DCS areas, because clearly there are no comprehensive participants outside of the DCS areas, and the tracking and inclusion probabilities for participants in the non-DCS areas. And so when we got these, again, then we recalibrated them to the population. And so what we have in CLSA, or what we, well, well what we still have, but what we will um, be uh, um, updating soon, are three types of inflation weights and three types of analytic weights. So if you are um, doing analyses where you're only using the tracking participants, there's a set of weights for those. If you're only using comprehensive participants, there's a set of weights for those. And if you're using all 50,000 some odd participants, then there's a set of weights for those. And we have both inflation and analytic weights available. So we did all that work. The question is then, why do we need new weights? And with many studies, as we move along, I think you, um, you um, would always want to try and improve what you've done. But our original um, anticipation was that most of, the, most of the analyses would be conducted at the province level or at the level of Canada. And so we use the CCHA Healthy Aging to Calibrate both the tracking and comprehensive weights. But CCHS healthy aging weights, um, they were very good for, um, for estimating parameters at the province level and at the level of the health region. So not really at the level of the data collection site catchment area as we were using them. And so as, as they worked very well for the tracking cohort, they worked a little bit less well for the DCSs. Because again, if you think about the data collection sites, it really is, it's not even like in terms of the data collection site in Hamilton, it's not really 25 to 50 kilometers around the center of Hamilton, it's around where the data collection site is located in Hamilton. So in Hamilton, we include um, Hamilton, but there's also people from Burlington, from Oakville, and for some of the more rural areas like Flamborough and Hamilton. So it doesn't really line up necessarily with one health region. 
And as well, there was a project that kind of brought this to our, our, our um, or made us aware of this, um, where they were interested in using CLSA data at the sub-provincial level. And what they were finding is it was not necessarily um, reflecting um, well in terms of what we knew from census data. And the other thing that, as you remember, what we wanted to do is we, we knew that we wanted to increase the variability or our power to look at analyses with respect to income and education and other SES factors. Um, we knew that the, um, that the sample was not, it was representative in many, in many respects. If we look at, say, some many um, chronic conditions in Canada, we look at them with CLSA, it will match pretty well, but it was less, matched less well when we looked at some of these SES factors. So we thought that maybe we could go back and do a little bit better. Um, one of the other issues is although CCH healthy aging was ideal for many reasons, especially that it really was the population of CCHS was essentially our target population in CLSA, they actually used the 2006 census um, to help with, to construct their sampling weights. So what we wanted to do was we wanted to use something that was a little bit more in line with um, when we actually did our recruitment in CLSA. So we're now using the 2011 National Household Survey to do our, um, to do our, our calibration. And again, the additional refinement, which I think is important, is that we used the individual level rather than the geographic um, level variable for education, for our weight calibration. So what is that going to look like? Um, this is a little bit of a busy slide, but if you focus on the blue column, so if we look at CLSA overall, the 51,338, you could see it, the age distribution of our unweighted sample. But if you look at our old weights and our new weights, it's fairly similar, as you would expect, because we're really not changing the, um, the way that we're calibrating that much in terms of age. So it's fairly similar, similar in terms of age. But where it really differs is when you start looking at education. So here we have education, the, the first row in education is post-secondary degree or diploma, and then the last row is less than secondary school graduation. So again, if we look at that last uh, three columns, you could see that there's quite a difference between the old weights and the new weights, and that the old weights actually were fairly similar to the unweighted analyses, where the new weights are quite different. And you can see here where they differ the most. So here, the light blue column is the unweighted um, estimate in terms of the proportion of people in each of the education categories. The darker blue is the old weights, and the kind of medium blue is the new weights. And you can see where the big difference is, is in the two extremes. So in, now when we're estimating the um, education in the, uh, in our target population, it's looking a lot more like what we know it to be through our census data. So, before, there was fewer people that we would estimate would be in the lower levels of education, and now it is uh, much higher in the, in the lower levels. So we have this SES distribution that is more reflective of our target population. So what should a researcher expect? Um, in most cases, the point estimates of prevalence or associations will be similar, but it should better reflect the target population, especially in the DCS catchment areas. 
Um, we can also say that the underestimates of low SES status will be lessened with the new weights and that um, parameter estimates for variables strongly associated with SES are likely to be more affected. So it may be that if you are looking at associations that are not, um, not strongly associated with SES, you'll get very, very similar results. You'll get less um, similar results potentially for um, associations where things are various, or sorry, for um, estimates where that are very uh, highly associated with SES. But again, the overall estimates will better reflect our target population. Um, what you should not expect from our new weights, although we kind of uh, started this because people, we were recognizing that at levels smaller than the um, geographic area smaller than the province that our, our weighted data were not necessarily reflecting the census data, um, we cannot, even using the population in a specific DCS area, we will not provide estimates at the city level. Um, again, the data collection sites are only at 11 locations across Canada, and the catchment areas include that geographical region, 20 to 50 kilometers around the data collection site. So it's not necessarily um, a specific city. It depends on where your data collection site is located within the city. So we just need to be clear that, that um, we still cannot do city-level estimates with the CLSA data. Um, the data will, or sorry, the weights will be available um, soon. It'll be this fall, and they will be provided to people that um, that are currently holding data for uh, for projects using CLSA. You'll get an email, and they will offer you the opportunity to get the new weights. For new projects, if you've not yet received your data from CLSA, um, the new weights will be the only weights that will be provided except uh, under a special request. Um, what's coming next in terms of the weights? Um, we know that um, this is something that's come up a fair bit now that people are thinking about using, doing longitudinal analyses with the baseline and follow-up one. Uh, the baseline analytic weights can be used for longitudinal analyses using baseline and follow-up one, um, but we will be creating new follow-up one inflation weights. Um, for estimates of descriptive parameters at follow-up one. And these weights will be, um, or we need to create these new weights because we know that both the CLSA population is a bit different at follow-up one due to attrition in the sample, but it also, um, we are gonna be using new census data that's going to reflect how the po target population has changed between baseline and follow-up one. And um, this is critical because often many of the um, parameters we may be interested in is looking at um, estimates of prevalence at follow-up one. So we may be interested in looking at chronic conditions for example, at baseline and follow-up one. As well, there's some um, modules in the CLSA that are unique to follow-up one, so we didn't even have them at baseline. So to estimate those um, descriptive parameters, we'll need these new weights. So we, we are working on those. That's gonna be um, the next thing in the queue, and we will keep you in the loop as to when they will be available. Um, the other thing that will be available soon that I kind of uh, alluded to at the beginning what is this new technical document that was led by um, Dr. Henry So. It's, um, it's actually quite useful in that it, provi it provides a number of, um, of uh, situations, estimates for different ty types of parameters, so for descriptive parameters, 
for um, for looking at relationships, so looking at logistic regression, um, looking at estimating relative risks, et cetera, using different uh, statistical software. So he's gone through how you would do this with the CLSA data, including the weights and including the strata in R, SAS, SPSS, and STATA, and shows you how you might get slightly different estimates depending on which statistical software that you use. So I think I will end it there. I'd like to acknowledge our funders and as well um, as Dr. Wilson said at the beginning, if there are questions, our contact information is here in terms of data inquiries and general inquiries. But I think I'd like to stop and take questions now. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Lauren. I, I really do uh, appreciate and acknowledge how much thought and how much work went into not only developing the new weights, but thinking about how these needed to, present it, to be presented to the approved applicants and the potential applicants for the data. So I really, really, really appreciate that. Um, I'm going to open it up. I say I'm opening it up to questions, but basically I'm going to read some of the questions that were put into the chat. I've been copying and pasting them as they came in. Uh, so I'll just start with the first one uh, that came in. So, and I'm just quoting here, what if the sample of males, and this is an early question that came in, what if the sample of males are not representative of males? Studies show that lower the response rates, the less likely they are to be representative of their group, in your case, ma males. So weighting in this case may magnify their non-representativeness. So I don't know if you have any comment about that. This refers to your specific example. Sure, sure. And that's, I mean, that's clearly um, a, a worry in any, in any of the large studies now because many of the response rates are not as high as some of the studies by Statistics Canada. And even Statistics Canada now is having slightly lower response rates than they used to. Um, it, it, that is one of the reasons why we created the new weights, because we did acknowledge that while um, we looked at, um, well, let me take a step back. We actually um, were, we did want to see, we cannot say that the CLSA is completely representative of the target population in Canada, but what we can say is we've used a number of different sources, including um, including census data, other Health Canada surveys that had, or, and sorry, Stats Canada surveys that had very high response rates, and we had very similar um, estimates based on those compared to the studies that that we're using our weighted data compared to what we know are close estimates to what are what is going to be in our target population. What we were less good at was some of these SES factors. So while we worked really hard to make sure that we had heterogeneity in SES so that we could still do estimate our associations, it wasn't as representative. So we are hoping in these new weights that it actually is a bit more representative. And that does seem to be the case just by comparing CLSA weighted data to these other sources. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So the second question we had is a little bit, uh, not so much about the weights, but about the sampling. So I'll just uh, read it to you. How would your sampling by a phone and in person affect the ability to sample other underrepresented groups, i.e. the homeless or the transient? I mean, that's a, it's a very good question. And one of the criteria for inclusion criteria for CLSA is that people had to be able to respond in English or in French. So there may be some populations, um, even thinking about refugees or or other um, or, or other groups that will not be represented in the CLSA for that reason. Yeah. I think in terms of the homeless and for for some of these other groups, I, I absolutely think that it's it's 
very challenging to try and include them in in studies of this sort because you know there there's um, in terms of the way that we are recruiting, that is definitely a challenge, and that may will likely be very up, underrepresented in CLSA. It's interesting as well in terms of it's a challenge to recruit um, people like this, but they tend to be more mobile, so it's also a challenge to keep people in the CLSA. Yeah, I think, Cammie, I going back to the planning of the study, a number of decisions had to be made, uh, which does limit the overall generalizability of the results from the CLSA because there were practical implications about recruitment of uh, certain individuals that would have required a whole new strategy. So, but yeah. I think it's a very important thing to keep in mind, uh, you know, when we're interpreting the results. No, absolutely. So back to the weight a little bit. So the next question is, since inflation and analytic weights are proportional, are there any concerns with using analytic weights instead of inflation weights for descriptive estimates of a population, like sex, age, education categories? For example, we might not want the weighted number of males and females to be calibrated up to the Canadian population. I'm not sure I 100% understand that question. I think in terms of the estimates, um, you should be able to get the estimates to the target population. If you're thinking about in terms of estimates of variance, um, the estimates of variance are actually um, relative to the sample size of the CLSA. So it's not acting as if you have, you know, 15 million people in your sample. But I'm, I'm, I don't know. Um, Maybe if there could be a clarification. I'm not sure if I answered that. Okay, but maybe we can take this one off offline and sure. uh, and, and think about it a little bit more, and perhaps even get back to the the person who asked the question. Uh, next question. So, with these new weights, how does this change affect the modeling results when edu when an education variable is used as a covariate in the model? So um, it it. It depends, again, I think, on how strongly education is associated with your, with your, if you're just using it as a uh, covariate and a model, if it's not strongly associated with the association that you are estimating, then it probably still won't have a big effect. But we do recommend that you include education then in the models that you run. And that's, uh, I should also mention that um, there will be a new technical document that is available when the new weights are, are um, made available. We'll have a new doc technical document on the website that will go through a, some of these uh, issues. Okay. Okay, so the next question is a very practical question. So it says, I'm currently on a project using the wave one. I'm assume that that baseline, being the first manuscript already accepted for a peer-reviewed journal, and we're moving on to the second manuscript, would you recommend to apply the new weights for the second manuscript? Also, what would I do with the already accepted manuscript? Very practical question. Yes, and this is this is challenging for sure, and we know yeah. that there's, there's a number of manuscripts that have already been um, submitted and published. And one of the things that we do, um, I, I think each, each, first of all, for the question, I think each of the, you know, each of the researchers are going to have to decide what they're going to do in a situation like this. Um, what you can do is get the new weights, and if it really doesn't change things much, then, then you're good to go and you're fine. If it does change things, then you have to decide what is the most appropriate um, what, what is the most appropriate thing to report? If it's already been published, clearly you can't change that. Okay. Um, one thing that we do in CLSA that's part of the data sharing agreement is that in every in the acknowledgement, it's clear what data set was used. So at least we have a record of the data set that was used in to, um, to 
create the analyses that were um, reported. So it should be at least um, to, if someone really wanted to look to see which weights were used, you could, you could clearly see which ones were included in the data set. Right, right. And I think also, of course, consult the statistician that you're working with uh, about how to address this as well, I think is important. No, absolutely. So one more question, and I know the answer, but I'm going to let you answer it, Lauren. Is the technical report you mentioned in your last slide that compares estimates resulting from different statistical software available on the CLSA website, or is it only accessible to project holders in CLSA? It will be available. It will be. Yes. Yeah, it will <laughs> Not be. right yet, but it will be available on the CLSA website because it actually um, will likely become a uh, manuscript that will be much more uh, widely distributed. Um, I think it's, it's a very, very useful document and goes through a number of different types of analyses, I think most of which um, would be the way that people have approached using CLSA data are included in this document. So I think it'll be a very, very useful document. I think I will, I'll just add to this that at the CLSA we do our best to provide as many what we call data support documents as possible on the website because we know that often people who are considering using the data want to find out a little bit more about how things work before they make the application. Uh, so we do try to get as much as possible up on the website. Yes. Okay. So I, I don't see any more questions, but I, I have a, a question that I, I sort of come across even with the old weights and the new weights. So a number of approved projects and a lot of people who are looking at the CLSA data are focusing on a particular subgroup. And mm -hmm. it's not always a subgroup that's defined by age or geography or by sex, but it's, sometimes it's a characteristic. So, for instance, caregivers or immigrants or people with a particular condition. And I've always struggled with whether if the analysis is limited to that subgroup, whether we should or should not apply sampling weights or whether there's even a clear uh, answer to that? No, that is, I mean, that's a very good question, and it's, and it's clearly a lot of people are interested in not necessarily looking at everyone in the CLSA, but just a subgroup. And that's actually, um, the weights should still be used, or that, at least that yeah. is our, um, our, our uh, position. And it's that type of analysis is actually covered in the um, the new technical report that we'll be putting out. So even examples of how to do it are okay. going to be included in that report. Oh, well, that's, that's great. So I, I will be looking eagerly for that as well. well I think we're going to wrap it up now. I want to thank um, Lauren, of course, for giving the presentation and the team, as you acknowledged in the beginning, who worked on, on this with you. I want everyone to know that I did uh, cut and paste all of the questions. Uh, so we will, Lauren and I will be going through them and, and determining whether there are some nuggets in there that we want to make sure that they go into the frequently asked questions section on the website. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone, because I'm sure there are some of you that are interested in accessing the data at some point, the next deadline for applications is January the 7th, 27th. I'll say it again, January the 27th, 2021. And if you visit the CLSA website under data access, you'll find the, what data will be available and additional information and as well the data support documents I just mentioned. I'd also like to remind you to complete the survey. This is very, very helpful for us. And of course, stay tuned uh, to hear about the CLSA webinar in November, which is going to have an update of the COVID-19 studies and you'll get details to follow and you can check the website. Uh, so thanks, thanks everyone again for attending, and again, thank you, Lauren, uh, for the presentation.